Hello, hello, friends. Welcome to today's webinar about how real-time, real-world data creates value across the therapeutic life cycle. My name is Katie Smith-Green. I'm the Content Marketing Manager here at Current Health, and uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Our presenters today are Eli Goldberg, our VP of Data Science. Can I get a slide change, please? There we go. Our VP of Data Science and Lucy Coison, our Senior Director of Pharma Partnerships here at Current Health. Eli is a recovering academic and entrepreneur. He was formerly the Senior Director of Data Science in Clinical Analytics at CVS Aetna, and he has also served as the lead for digital endpoints at Novartis Institutes for Biomedical Research. Lucy has spent the last decade on the commercial side of life sciences, supporting drug developers with novel technology from early stage research to translational through to the clinic. She has worked at early stage startups and public companies, including Science37, Genentech, Thermo Fisher, formerly Life Technologies. And with that, I'll pass it off to Lucy. Thank you, Katie. It's great to be here today. All right, so in our view, the key to success is having the right window into the home and the ability to decentralize the capture of data such that real-time viewing, transfer, and analysis of that data meets all the demands of decentralized healthcare today. We're going to talk a bit about capturing data in a, recent, in a decentralized world and how to think about the value of that data across the drug development life cycle. And we'll close with a case study that highlights the potential of real-time decentralized data capture for both reducing costs and patient burden. But first, a little bit about current health. So we sit at the intersection of clinical care delivery and clinical research delivery. Today, more than half of our business is supporting health systems around the world. We believe the majority of healthcare is moving out of brick and mortar facilities and into the home over the coming decade. Current Health's mission is to both empower and enable healthcare organizations, including pharma companies, to move care into the home in a safe way. At Current Health, we work day in and day out because we believe in the vision of connected health. In the new world of decentralized healthcare, the synergy of people and technology will result in more efficiency, better outcomes, and a better healthcare experience for patients. We support pharma as a technology infrastructure and data partner across clinical trials in developing exploratory endpoints, and because of our reach into the clinical care space and our unique ability to longitudinally engage the patient, we can support market access initiatives and patient support programs after approval. We are a global company operating on five continents, though the majority of our business is in the United States. Our hardware and software has FDA 510K class two clearances and we're CE marked for use in the European Union. So if you too believe that clinical care and research is moving into the home, what kind of platform and support infrastructure should you, should you consider for decentralized data capture? You're going to wanna to consider a platform that integrates a range of devices from low acuity to high acuity to support all patient populations. Our platform is device agnostic and we are unique in that we've developed a device to monitor the highest acuity patients with comorbidities at serious risk of deterioration. Our proprietary wearable, which is shown in the upper left of the slide, uh, monitors respiratory rate, pulse rate, oxygen saturation, temperature, and mobility continuously. We've already integrated devices for capturing blood pressure, glucose, weight, pulmonary function, core temperature, and the sky is the limit in terms of parameters that can be captured from digital devices. Sleep, voice, EKG, auscultation, various forms of activity, all of these types of data are integrated or can be integrated to give study teams one window into the patient's health remotely. We unify sensors together with ePro and other data. However, we really focus on the actionability of that data. In other words, who is the patient in the home who actually needs a clinical intervention? We alert care teams or study teams to the patients that need attention so that they can triage appropriately. We offer a suite of patient healthcare provider communication tools such as televisits and messaging, as well as services including logistics, device management, IRB support, in-home connectivity and project management to ensure smooth operations. Finally, we support clinical sites with services like our 24-7 Clinical Command Center, which is staffed with licensed nurses who operate on behalf of sites to take clinical responsibility of their patients if they cannot do so themselves. You may have heard that Current Health was acquired by Best Buy, the consumer electronics company, late last year. 
So where and how does Best Buy fit in? The hardest part of delivering care in the home is not the tech, it's not the sensors, it's that you're frequently dealing with an 80 year old patient who may not have access to the internet, who may not have a smartphone, and who is certainly not used to using these type of devices. This is the population that you most want to get at, the population that needs the most help, and it's really difficult to do this. You need to ensure that they have that connectivity, that they have access to a means of virtual communication, that it's easy to set up and that it works for them. What Best Buy gives us is the capability to be in local communities, to leverage Geek Squad, to go into the home and get technology working for patients. Best Buy also gives current health access to a large universe of connected devices so that we can truly do BYOD in a way that wasn't possible before. Best Buy brings final mile services, which is a quite exciting proposition for health systems and pharma partners. All right, so I know that I am preaching to the choir. The case for decentralized trials, yep, there you go, uh, is quite clear. Increased trial access, reduced bur burden on participant, reduced trial dropout, all translate into accelerated clinical research. The case for decentralized healthcare is equally clear. A better patient experience, reduced rates of infection, reduced readmissions, and patients prefer to recover in their homes with their family, pets, and support network. We see this clearly in the data from our hospital at home programs across the world. But actually putting this into practice can be really hard. We want the patient to be in the environment that they want to be in, to have a very low burden. No one wants to be in the hospital or the clinic, but moving data capture to the home creates a unique set of benefits and challenges. First, we can capture data that is more representative of daily life. A great clinical example of this is white coat hypertension. Traditionally, blood pressure was measured in the clinic and hypertension diagnosed there. Turns out that there's a lot of people that have higher blood pressure simply due to anxiety of being around the hospital. Now we do ambulatory blood pressure capture. We can access a much more rural, much more diverse trial population, which is critical to ensuring the trial populations look like future patient populations. We can also make it easier for patients, which translates into higher retention. However, all of these benefits have the inverse challenges. Whilst we get greater representation of daily life, we see greater variability. We do quite a bit of work in identification of CRS for patients receiving immunotherapies. Patients might develop tachycardia or tachypnea associated with CRS. However, patients that are quite unwell that walk up the stairs might develop tachycardia or tachypnea. How do you differentiate between the instance of the patient walking up the stairs with the patient in a CRS event? How do you ensure that the population you most want to get to, the older population or the population that is on the other side of the digital divide has access and that the tech is accessible? We'll talk about that in a minute. How do you guard against incorrect or inconsistent usage across a study? I think, you know, anyone who has used digital health tools in clinical trials knows that the most critical factor impacting success in decentralized data capture is adherence. The technology is simply not useful unless patients can access it easily and they stay adherent throughout the protocol. This should be the single most important metric as nothing else matters. There will be no data and no insights from that data without adherence. This is oversimplifying, but it's really about making sure the technology reaches the patient at their home, ensuring that quick start guides are simple and straightforward, providing a layer of support if necessary that can go into the home and set up the trial tech, sorry, excuse me, can go into the home and set up the trial tech for the patient. This is where the Geek Squad could be leveraged for clinical trials, nudging the patient hourly, daily, or as required. Communicating with the patient in the format that they prefer across almost every channel, even considering a physical channel such as a Best Buy storefront. Help desk support wherein it's an actual person on the other end of the line that can help if troubleshooting is needed. You can drive success in study adherence by considering access and accessibility ahead of the study. Is connectivity included in the solution? Do, does the patient have the right devices or a smartphone? Is the setup straightforward or can it be completed by in-home support? Pro tip, healthcare professionals do not want to be your IT support layer. 
Accessibility is really just around ease of use. Just because the patient has access to a portal does not mean that they'll remember their password. Think about the simplicity of the patient experience, especially in the context of patients that aren't that tech savvy. Does the patient have to upload their own data or does that occur automatically in the solution? Do they have to update any tech during the length of the study or does that occur remotely automatically? Are the instructions simple? Are they in their language? Which data you capture using what sensor technology and for how long over what period of time can vary depending on the evidence generation requirements and balancing clinical risk with the optimal patient experience. In this hypothetical example, one may wanna capture ePro and eDiary weekly throughout the entire study period, but capture vitals continuously for only a period of days after an infusion cycle, and then capture additional vitals parameters intermittently, say it's weight and pulmonary function, once daily for a period of several weeks. In each instance, you want to minimize burden on patients in capturing data, and you wanna ensure that sites have access to real-time information via one unified dashboard, especially if the clinical risk requires it. It is a lot easier to do things in the site than in the home because that's what we're used to and that's what's been happening for the last 100 years. These are not insurmountable challenges though. It's just about considering upfront how best to bring the research or care into the patient's home and what kind of infrastructure is required. Success in a decentralized world requires streamlining the last mile of care. This means reducing friction and integrating support services to ensure the patient is supported and engaged throughout the study. The biggest reason that the acquisition of Best Buy uh, the acquisition of Current Health by Best Buy made strategic sense, and the most exciting part to me is this. Best Buy can really move the needle in the delivery of last mile care in a big way. Everything from device management, to the geek squad, to the community presence of brick and mortar stores, to consumer trust. Successful execution of the last mile of care will translate into data capture from patients in their home, which will mean rich representative data sets that can generate value from development through post-marketing. Great. Thanks, Lucy. <clears throat> it seems pretty obvious, but drugs don't work for people who don't take them, and they also don't work if you can't tell they're working. If you're keeping up to date with the FDA, you might also have concern that your drug won't even be approved if it doesn't drive meaningful quality of life improvements. If you've also spent any time downstream and you know what it's like to be in trade in a big payer, the plot thickens even more. You really have to justify the value of your drug, not against the cost to manufacture or innovate, but against the impact that your drug can have on the fundamental healthcare economy. Now, you may be shocked to hear that the average price for a specialty drug is something like $84,000 per year. And as you can imagine, controlling the rising cost of specialty drugs for pharmacy benefits managers, for plan sponsors, for businesses in general is absolutely critical to their survival. So the question is, how does real-time, real-world data align the value throughout the therapeutic life cycle? And I hope this will be fun, but I'm going to use a bit of an interesting analogy here. I'm going to use the failure of some weight loss miracle drugs as an opportunity to drive home key points about how data matters across the therapeutic life cycle. Now, I'm not sure if you guys have heard, but America is overweight and zip codes matter. This is actually a non-Hispanic white adult um, obesity map, and you can see that it's pretty varied by state and location, but paints a fairly bleak picture. Now, this is the same map for non-Hispanic Black adults. Um, obviously, there are deeply embedded societal implications and externality of healthcare disparities, and the reality is, is that the people that we're studying are very different, and drugs work very differently for everybody. And so it's really critical and a really huge justification for the continued decentralization of trials to try to understand and address and really ensure that we're studying the right populations. But the question is, what if there were maybe a magical pill that could help people lose weight? That would be awesome, right? So let's kick off this story by zooming back to the past. The year is 1996. Uh, Independence Day is, is eating up the box office. And FenFen, the miracle weight loss drug, has just come on the market and people were losing their minds. On the left-hand side here, you see on the cover of Time, the hot new diet pill. And people, even people with advanced degrees, like this guy in the middle with an MD, are, are just 
hopping on the bandwagon of this miracle drug here. This person is one of the most embarrassing pre-post photos, although he looks like he's lost weight in the one on the right, he's way more tan than the one on the left, which is a very interesting pre-post. But like I said, people were absolutely losing their minds. Now I wanna zoom ahead, not that far, to 1997. It's one year later, and FenFen has been removed from the market for causing idiopathic pulmonary primary hypertension and cardiac valve disorder. Not good, right? And people are starting to talk of, about what life is like after FenFen. And the plot thickens. So if you zoom ahead a bit in this FenFen less world, um, people haven't stopped wanting this magical silver bullet that is a weight loss pill. At the same time that Tesla is fundamentally rolling out its first production cars more than a decade after FenFen first came off the market, um, there's a battle going on again with two drugs, Casemia and Belvique. And once again, people are absolutely losing their minds. Here on the right-hand side are actually some pharmacists who are literally posing with boxes of Belvique. It was absolutely insanity. These, these people are behaving like drug lords. It's, 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 it's wild. And of course, interestingly, one year later, surprise, surprise, Belvique is actually reclassified as a schedule four drug that causes hallucinations. I, I guess hallucinogens are, are good for weight loss, I don't know, but no surprise down the road, 2020, um, a safety clinical trial actually showed an increased risk of cancer and Belvique was removed entirely from the market with sort of very little fanfare. Now there's some great new drugs that are sort of new heavyweight contenders in this area. Nova Nordisk has a, good drug, a great drug, which is a semaglutide, which is a, a, a drug class that's been on the market um, and used for diabetes for a long time. But I won't talk about some of the new drugs or the companies that are developing them. I, what, I, what I hope to do now is to use my remaining time to give a bit of a whistle-stop tour through some of the driving data-centric questions across the therapeutic life cycle, using these two drug failures as an opportunity to retrospect in terms of how real-time, real-world data could have helped. So I'm going to avoid the early phase, and we're going to talk about stuff sort of post-phase one. Now, when you're thinking about phase one, the question you're trying to answer, obviously, is, is it safe? Um, and real world safety data is, is critical and, in, and a very easy sort of low hanging fruit in terms of um, industry targets. Now, obviously both of these drugs had clear safety issues that weren't detected across the whole life cycle. But I guess the question that I would wanna ask is what would we have done differently and would, have, would real time data have indicated a safety signature in the early phase? And I think perhaps, FenFen caused primary pulmonary hypertension, and these are things that I think we could have observed and reported, right? Extreme tiredness or fatigue could have been a digital PRO, an EPRO, and maybe actigraphy. A shortness of breath with actigraphy could have been remote spirometry and, and, and activity measurement. Dry cough, dizziness, fainting, all PROs. Swelling in the ankle of legs could have been blood pressure on a scale, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These are all things that when you select them during simple moments that matter in the yesteryear example, in terms of people go to a clinical testing site, maybe one, two, three or four times during a phase one, um, I think we could have picked up on these things a little bit earlier. Now, Belvique being a hallucinogen, I'm not really sure how we missed that. That seems pretty, I don't know, kind of a low hanging fruit, but maybe it could have been a PRO. Honestly, I'm not really sure what happened with Belvique with the safety signature there, to be, to be honest. Now with phase two, the question that you need to answer is, does it work? And of course, at what dose? Now the data in phase two is really designed to support an increased understanding of the relationship between the treatment effect and the dose. And obviously data here is critical for decision-making and internal decision-making, right? Does this drug continue? Do we continue to pump a billion dollars into this next phase? Now decentralization and digital endpoints I think are in general gaining in popularity. And I think that they usually sort of come in two different, I would say, flavors or categories. The first flavor are functionally traditional endpoints that have been digitized. So these are things like PROs, spirometry, weight, temperature, et cetera. These are things that are typically measured in a clinic, but now we can do that at home. Those are a little bit different than the stereotypically exploratory endpoints that might not be registratable, but can certainly help make a decision, particularly an internal decision about whether or not a drug advances. And of course, these run the spectrum of novelty. Now for these two weight loss drugs, you could definitely deploy a remote scale or a BP cuff, and you could have decreased the cost to execute these studies, I think, by monitoring patients at home. But critically, in thinking about these large sort of zip code based endemic factors to healthcare in America, you could have also increased the fraction of eligible patients 
who might not have had time to trek across town to their local or indeed not local testing site. Um, you could have also deployed a series of PROs to continue to monitor safety signals and relay back quality of life, um, even within the phase two. Now, real-time real-world data is obviously more than just safety. Um, here, we're thinking about it in terms of creating an efficacy signal. And shifting a bit from the weight loss drug sort of line, there are definitely critical scientific moments that matter in patients' lives that actually can be the right time to intervene, but are actually super difficult to do without real-time real-world information. A couple of examples that I've called out here, COVID drugs, right? COVID drugs that are not prophylactic for getting COVID, but for instance, decrease hospitalization if taken early, where early is defined by testing and temperature and symptoms, a critical area for real-time real-world data. Or congestive heart failure, where you might want to target a patient that's retaining fluid, for instance, by monitoring their weight, but hasn't yet admitted. Or for oncology patients that are, for instance, desatting post-therapy or at risk for cytokine release syndrome for which you really need to be able to identify and predict and then do something conditional on real-time data. So it's pretty critical in this efficacy phase as well. Now thinking about phase three, there are all sorts of, I think, business efficacy questions that start to come in. And phase three is of course to confirm efficacy in a broad population, but it's also market signaling that lets the rest of the industry know that your drug, how your drug compares to the competition. How much better are you? What's the relationship between dose and fiscal impact to payers and providers and patients in comparison to the market? And of course, what data can you capture to increase safety, to optimize efficacy, decrease costs, and of course, decrease access barriers and or generally can create a competitive advantage or efficacy advantage for your downstream partners. And I'll talk about a little bit more of that in detail in, in a moment. But I think my time here is almost up. Um, and I think other than not being a FenFen or Belvik, I think there's some critical lessons learned here in retrospect. And I think a lot of my advice about the value of data capture across the therapeutic life cycle can be really thought of in terms of what happens when we work backwards from our downstream partners. As I said in the beginning, the average price for a specialty drug is around $84,000 per year. And these days, you absolutely have to justify the value of your drug, not just against the cost to manufacture, to innovate, but against the impact that your drug has on the healthcare economy. And as you think about your data needs across the life cycle, people tend to separate, I think, unfortunately, the scientific process of drug development from the business of getting your drug into the hands of people that need it. And after all, after you exit your phase three, you're going to have to work with those downstream partners. And the more data that you've collected along the way that creates a clear value incentive for them, definitely the better. And I think this means you need to think about where your drug will be used and of course, how your drug will be prescribed and what data will give you that market advantage. A good example would be, let's say your drug may be similarly efficacious to another drug on the market, but your drug comes um, or your drug requires no, well, let's say the, the competitor drug requires a three-day hospital stay to make sure that you don't get CRS. Um, if you can demonstrate that your drug can be essentially administered at home, script volume is going to go through the roof. You'll create care opportunities for physicians and med cost savings for payers. But of course, you need the data to support real-time real-world realities. And finally, I think, and I'll point out, I, I think a big sort of real-time real-world data trend that I see and it's a bit of a scientific question with business undertones. And that is, what are the conditions under which your drug's efficacy and safety are truly best? And I'll leave you with a thought and one that you may have not realized is a trend that's already started, but mega payers like Aetna and PBMs like CVS's Caremark are among the first to actually think about using PROs and virtual care, not to say who gets the drug or not, although that's of course important in terms of being on the formulary, but in terms of thinking about real-time real-world data as a way to maximize efficacy. And so it's really, really critical to think about how we capture this information um, upstream and downstream. Lucy? Thank you. All right, I realize we are at time, but I'm gonna go a bit over to share this case study that we've been sharing as far and wide as we possibly can, because I think it's just so groundbreaking in its potential to move the needle for oncology patients. So we'll maybe go five minutes over. All right, so um, patients removing, or sorry, patients receiving immunotherapies are often required by the label to remain in the hospital for a set period of time to monitor for serious adverse events, such as cytokine release syndrome or CRS. 
CRS is an acute systemic inflammatory syndrome characterized by fever and multiple organ dysfunction. One pharmaceutical company we are working with uh, set out to change the required inpatient stay on their label by monitoring for CRS remotely using our regulatory cleared biosensors and monitoring software. The solution consists of continuous monitoring of five vitals, spot checking blood pressure, and EPRO's e-diaries for symptom reporting. This solution gives the treating oncologist a unified window into the patient's status remotely in real time, which I think is the most critical factor here. In addition, it gives the oncologist and their team built-in virtual visit capabilities to assess neurotoxicity, another immune-related adverse event from the same therapy, uh, using a battery of simple cognitive tests. If and when this trial is successful, the benefits to the patient, the pharma company, and the entire healthcare system are significant. We are talking about reducing time spent in the hospital, decreasing cost to the payer, uh, potentially increasing the utilization of the therapy. It really could be a grand success all around. It's worth noting uh, that both sponsors and healthcare systems like Vanderbilt and Mount Sinai are using our biosensors and monitoring software for the same application enabling recovery from CAR T infusions in the home instead of the hospital. The value proposition for health systems includes expanding access to life-saving therapies, increasing capacity, and reducing readmissions. Um, I shared this case study specifically because this is exactly the type of advancement that companies like ours are striving for, a better patient experience uh, with better outcomes at a lower cost. All right, we finish with just a couple minutes for questions. Actually, I think we're gonna to have to call it because we are pretty much out and I'm sure um, people have other things to run to today. So just wanted to say thank you to everyone for joining us. Um, I wanna give a quick plug for an upcoming uh, webinar event where we will be talking about EHR data and, and the integrations that really kind of make care at home um, and decentralized trial models work uh, on the backside. So thank you to everybody. Um, watch your inbox for a recording and a copy of the slides and we'll see you later. Bye.